if you can dream it, we can help you create it. Welcome to the You Create Podcast, the show that teaches you how to take the power and flexibility of a StepCraft 3D CNC system and turn your ideas into reality. So let your ideas flow because we want to know what will you create? Welcome to the first episode of the You Create Podcast. My name is Eric, and I'll be your host each week. The You Create Podcast was created to explore the maker in all of us. Everyone has ideas that they wish to create. However, that's usually where it ends for most people because they don't have the knowledge or the equipment to turn their ideas into reality. This podcast will break through that barrier and will cover hundreds of ways that you could start making ideas come true through the use of CNC and 3D printing technology. Now, don't let these terms scare you, because my goal is to make this entire process fun and easy. Now, I wanted to start off with full disclosure and let you know that this podcast is sponsored by StepCraft, and some of the content will be based around things that you can do with the StepCraft machines. Due to the universal nature of StepCraft and the ability to perform many different functions with the same machine, this system is perfect solution for those who wish to create things out of wood, plastic, foam, paper, and even aluminum. If you don't own a StepCraft machine, that's okay. After listening to a few episodes of this podcast, I'm sure you're going to want to get one. For those of you who own a machine other than a StepCraft, fear not. This podcast will be equally useful and informative to you as well. The ideas, as well as the tips and tricks that we talk about in this podcast, will apply to any CNC platform. And while we may talk about some specific items that relate to StepCraft in certain episodes, the bulk of the content is designed to be very universal. One common goal that many StepCraft customers have is the desire to create things that they can sell. Some want to create items that they could sell one-off versions of on websites like Etsy, while others are looking to create a full-blown business and sell items that they produce every day. My personal background is in business development, marketing, website development, and sales. And because of this, I will share the many concepts with you that I've learned over the years and hopefully be able to help you and your goal in starting a business if that's what you're looking to do. So with all that being said, I want to welcome you to the first episode and let's get started. All right. Since this is a new podcast I'm going to assume that many listeners are new to this technology. For those of you who are more advanced, I apologize. This will be a little bit of uh, kind of beginner theory that you would already know. But I want to start off by discussing a little bit about what we mean by the term CNC. Now, CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. That doesn't really say a lot, I guess. Well, at least you know from the definition that involves a computer, so there's no surprises there. A CNC system will take something that you create, design, or draw on a computer, and will turn it into machine code that tells the CNC machine how to move and make your part. Think of it kind of like an inkjet printer, but rather than outputting a paper, the output is in the form of a three-dimensional part. Now, throughout this podcast, we're going to talk about a couple of different types of CNC machines. One in particular that we're going to focus on initially is the CNC router, which could also be referred to as a mill or a carving machine. The other type of CNC machine that we're going to spend some time talking about as well is a 3D printer. Both machines are considered CNC in that they both use a drawing program that converts to machine code, which tells the machine to move in three axes. However, milling and CNC routing is considered a subtractive technology in that you're removing material from a base piece such as wood to create a finished part, where 3D printing is an additive technology where you're applying layers of plastic Uh, to create a part essentially from nothing. So in this first episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about the CNC router kind of machine. And uh, in future episodes, we'll certainly discuss a lot with regards to 3D printing as well. As I mentioned before, a CNC moves among three separate axes. Uh, We refer to those as an X, a Y, and a Z. Now, the x-axis is when you look at the machine from the front, 
that would be moving the head or the tool of the machine from the left to the right. So that would be referred to as the x-axis. The y-axis is when you move the machine from the front to the back. And the z-axis is when you move the head or the tool up and down. So those are the, the three main movements that you're going to hear us talk a lot about uh, in future episodes. And uh, it's important that you know, uh, you know what's X, Y, and Z, especially when we're referring to different software and we talk about zeroing out a part. You're going you're gonna to need to know what we mean by that. To move the machine along these three axes, we are using three separate motors. Uh, the type of motor that is used in a CNC machine is commonly referred to as a stepper motor. It's an encoded motor that every time it makes a movement, which is referred to as a step, and the, the distance of that movement varies from motor to motor, the software knows exactly how much that motor has moved. So a typical AC or DC motor, when you turn it on, apply power, it just starts spinning. And when you shut it off, uh, it, it, inertia will make it continue to spin a little bit until the motor shuts down. Uh, but there is no encoding, so you don't know exactly how many RPMs or, or how much that motor has moved. A stepper motor, on the other hand, takes pulses from a controller and it moves these motors very, very, very specifically to acquire the movement that you need to control the head on the CNC machine. They move extremely fast and they're very, very precise. On uh, most CNC machines, it's not uncommon that it'll hold a tolerance of a thousandth of an inch or better. So the stepper motors, you don't, you don't need to know a lot about the technology, but it is important to, to recognize that, that they are not standard motors. And when you're working on a CNC machine and you're doing maintenance uh, or you're assembling one from a kit, to make the motors more precise, it helps when you assemble the machine to make sure that all of the moving parts are properly uh, lubricated. Uh, if there's any friction, then that could cause the motor to what we call lose steps, and that will provide very undesirable results uh, when you're either 3D printing or you're milling. So we'll talk a lot more in the future episodes about maintaining your machine, but I wanted to get out of the way some of the basic parts of a CNC machine early on so that as we refer to them in future episodes, you know what we're talking about. So in addition to the motors, there are some other major parts of a CNC router specifically or CNC mill machine that I want to discuss with you and make sure that you understand what we're talking about when we mention them. Now, the first main part on, a, on most CNC machines is what we call the gantry. The gantry is the, it's probably the largest moving mass on a CNC machine and it controls the y-axis front to back and has the x-axis motor and assembly uh, as well as the z-axis mounted on it. So it's a, it's a pretty important part. The most important thing to be aware of with a gantry unit is when you're looking to buy a CNC machine, you want to make sure that this is a extremely rigid and solid component on the machine. Uh, when you think about it, the gantry is, is holding the spindle which we'll talk about in a minute, which is also holding the tool. And if there's any flexing at all in the gantry unit, that gets transferred directly to the tool, which will have a, an effect on the quality of the finished part uh, that you have, especially if you're carving, where you've got a lot of intricate details, the rigidity of the gantry is going to provide you with a, a, a better final part. The gantry also will determine the maximum workable height of your part, uh, usually as a specific uh, distance up, which controls your Z travel. And depending on what applications you're going to use, you need to keep this in mind when you're considering purchasing a CNC machine. You want to make sure that you have enough Z height travel. Uh, the gantry is large enough to accommodate the thickness of the part that you're going to want to run or the base stock. Now, it's also important to note a lot of people have misconceptions about this where they'll be convinced that they need to have a Z height that's you know, 8, 10 inches tall. However, even though your Z may move that high, the at the end of the spindle is a tool and you're not ever going to take use of the entire thickness of that part because the tool is usually only 2 or 3 inches tall max. So... 
you know, it's a little bit of a misconception that you need to have a super tall Z height on your machine. Uh, so you really need to just consider, uh, I would think something, a machine that's between three and six inches is probably going to take care of 90% of the applications out there for most people who would be listening to this podcast. Now the gantry also, as I mentioned, holds what's called a spindle and the spindle can be a router such as a trim router, like from DeWalt, Bosch, or Makita. Uh, it could be a hand tool, such as a Dremel or a Proxon, where the machine would have an adapter to hold those tools. And, or it could be a, something proprietary. For instance, uh, on a Stepcraft system, there's an HF500, which is their high-frequency or high-speed spindle that's proprietary to the Stepcraft machine. So you could use either a DeWalt, a Dremel, or a proprietary spindle, but the job of the spindle is to uh, spin the tool that will cut away the material. So some things to keep in mind there, depending on the type of material that you're planning on working with, you want to make sure that you have a spindle that's adequate in terms of power, and you also want to consider the length of runtime that it's going to take to produce some of your uh, milled parts and make sure that you have a spindle that is capable of running for that duration without burning up the motor or the bearings on it. As an example, a Dremel tool works great on a lot of CNC systems. Uh, We have an adapter for Stepcraft that will allow you to use the Dremel with no problem. However, the Dremel is not something that you would use successfully on a milling job or carving job that might take two to three hours to produce. It's just not designed to run for that long under load. Trim routers such as the DeWalt, Bosch, and Makita's, they are a little bit beefier. They have a lot more power. They're better for uh, maybe taking out deeper passes on harder materials like hardwood or plastics. Uh, usually though, the proprietary spindle is going to cost the most. However, it's going to have the most power and it's going to be designed to run for long periods of time under load. A proprietary spindle is also going to have a ability to adjust the RPM in the actual G code of the software that you're going to use. So if it was a specific material, you may want to run at 8,000 RPM. You can actually assign that in the software and the spindle will work at that RPM. Whereas a router such as a DeWalt or the Dremel tool, you have to manually control the spindle speed and it's not controlled by the software. Additionally, the powering on and off of the spindle is usually on a proprietary system is also taken care of by the software. Uh, Some machines, however, will have uh, kind of a power supply that you would plug a Dremel or a DeWalt into that will shut on and off based on code in the software so that the spindle can go on and off without you having to manually do it. But that's most machines, that's not common. You'd have to do it manually. If I was looking to mill parts out of aluminum, I would not be using uh, Dremel because the, the Dremel is just not designed to take that kind of a load unless you were taking very, very thin passes at very slow speeds. So if you're, if milling aluminum is, is something that you're considering, then you, you really need to be looking at a more proprietary spindle that has a lot of power that has the bearings and is designed to work under longer strains. So in addition to the spindle and the gantry, the gantry And all of the movements ride along what's called rail system. So the X, Y, and Z axis all have some sort of rails. And these can be made with slide bearings. Sometimes there's a track that have bearings on them. Uh, The Stepcraft machine uses an extruded aluminum material that creates a track. And we have our own specialized track rollers that we use with bearings that provide an extremely smooth and rigid movement on all axes. Usually the, the... rail system and the gantry and and the different moving parts are controlled by uh, obviously a stepper motor, but some are used belts that would go from the motor to the moving part. Uh, Some use uh, threaded rods. Uh, Some use ball screws. There's there's various different ways of doing it. The most reliable, in my opinion, is 
uh, using a threaded shaft or a ball screw. And basically it's, it's like a, it's a screw and the stepper motor will move uh, a specific amount. And, you know, given the screw that that's going to cause that, that uh, axie to move a specific amount according to that. So you tend to have the most precise movements on a CNC router when you're using some sort of a screw or, or ball screw type mechanism for moving the rail. Now, the other major component is uh, called the bed. And obviously that's the, the part of the, the CNC system where you're going to put your material that you're going to work on. Typically beds are made from wood or aluminum. Wood is usually a MDF material because it, it tends to be very flat. It's inexpensive. There's no warping usually with, with MDF. And on most jobs that you're going to mill, you're always going to have a spoil board, which is basically a, a piece of wood that you're going to put underneath the part you're mi machining so that when the bit passes through the part, it can go into the spoil board and you're not going to ruin the actual bed of your machine. Now, some CNC machines, the bed is actually made of MDF and it's also considered to be a spoil board. So after, you know, so many times of use, you're going to have all kinds of lines in it from the bit passing through the part and you'll either sand those down or you'll replace the MDF and, and make a new board. Other machines will use what's called a T-slot table, which is usually made out of aluminum. Uh, Stepcraft has both. We have a, a wood, which is kind of like a Formica covered uh, board that you would put down. And that's designed for some of the applications that we have on a Stepcraft machine that involve a drag knife and things like that. If you're milling on top of that board, you're always going to use an eighth or a quarter inch piece of uh, plywood or something uh, to use as a spoil board. Now, a T-slot table is a little bit different. There's channels milled in the, the table itself that allow you to put nuts with bolts to anchor your, your workpiece down. You definitely, if you're milling with a T-slot table, you always want to make sure you have a spoil board because if your bit were to pass through the finished part, you don't want it to bury itself and mar up a, a perfectly good and an oftentimes expensive T-slot table. So those are some of the basics as far as different bed types that they're available depending on various machines that are on the market. Now, we talked about the spindle, which is oftentimes referred to as also a router. Now, there's two other components that have relation to the spindle itself. One of them is called a collet and the other is the tool. Now, a collet is a compression type holder that fits inside the bottom of the spindle, it's the part that spins. And there's usually a nut on there to hold the tool in place. Now, collets are made in various sizes. You can get them you know, eighth inch, 16th, quarter, 3 16 all kinds of metric sizes. And the idea is, is depending on the tool diameter or the shank diameter of the tool, you're gonna wanna make sure you have a collet that matches that. So if, for instance, we're using an eighth inch diameter tool, we use an eighth inch collet. And when you put the tool inside the collet and you tighten the nut, the collet itself compresses or all the way around it on, on all sides. And it holds the tool firmly in place. And the design of it is so that when the, when the collet is, the tool is spinning, the, the collet is very, very true. And it's important to use a good grade collet so that you don't have any wobble uh, or deformity at all when your tool is spinning because that will cause vibration and it will give you a very undesirable results. So you always want to make sure to you have a couple extra collets. Sometimes if you were to have an issue with your program and you break a bit, it'll take the collet with it and then you'll end up deforming the collet and it won't, won't be any good. So they're not that expensive. It's just something you, you need to be aware of that you want to have more than one. Now, as far as the tools, they're commonly referred to as, as end mills a lot of times, and there's thousands of them. I mean, I'm not going to get into all of them in this particular podcast, but we will talk about very specific types and different applications for those as the show, future episodes in the show come about. Most common types of end mills are a ball nose, a flat nose, a V-carve, an engraving tool, etc., just like with the collets, if you're working on a job and you're using eighth inch flat nose end mill, 
when you go and buy your machine, make sure you have more than one because there's nothing that spoils uh, a fun day of CNC than when you break a bit and you don't have a replacement, you have to order one. Typically, end mills are not very expensive. Uh, usually, less than twenty dollars. You can get some for I've seen on Amazon for less than ten dollars a piece. Depending on the type of job that you're doing, if you're doing a carving job, for example, sometimes one job will require you to use more than one bit. A lot of times, if you're doing an intricate carving on a piece of wood, you'll use a flat nose, kind of larger diameter, like a 3 16 or a quarter inch diameter end mill, and you'll remove the bulk of the material from the part. And it'll, it'll calculate it out in the software. It'll get very close to the finished curves that you have on, on the part that you're going to create. And then what you do is you switch to a ball nose end mill, usually a smaller diameter, like an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch. And it will go in and it will make very intricate passes. And because the ball nose is curved on the bottom, it creates a very smooth carved looking finish. And again, we're going to talk about all of this stuff in future episodes. I'm just trying to give you a little bit of an overview right now. So now that we've identified the major components and parts of a CNC router system, I want to discuss the three basic steps to create a CNC project. They are design, the toolpath software, and machine control. And when it comes to design, any drawing or CAD program, and CAD, for those of you who don't know, stands for computer-aided design, uh, will work in a CNC program. Uh, there's software such as uh, SketchUp and Inkscape, which are free programs. SketchUp is a CAD drawing program, and Inkscape is a vector drawing program. And there's commercial software such as Adobe Illustrator and CorelDRAW, and there's commercial CAD software such as AutoCAD, SolidWorks, etc. Now, we will be diving into some specifics in these different software platforms in future episodes. But uh, the main thing is, is that, you know, you don't need to be a drawing wizard. Uh, a lot of these programs such as SketchUp uh, is free. It's very easy to use. There's thousands of videos online that'll walk you through uh, how to do specific things. And it's fun. It lets you, it's the first step in taking your creative idea and getting it into a form where you could actually produce it in real life. So don't let the design software scare you. Uh, we're going to walk through, we're going to make it fun and, and interesting, and we're going to give you resources as well to point you in the right direction. Now, Toolpath software is the second step. And basically what that's doing is that's taking what you've drawn, taking your design, and it's turning it into instructions that the CNC machine will use to create the final part. It's going to determine the size and types of tools that you use. It, you, you can put that information in and you select various lines on the drawing and you could tell it where to remove material, what, what tool you're going to use for certain applications. And it's going to do all of the calculations required to produce your final output. It's going to create what's called a G code file or a machine code file that is basically the language that the CNC machine uses to tell it what to do and how to move. And we're going to use machine control software, which I'll talk about in a second, to decipher that code and actually make the machine function based on it. We're going to discuss a lot of software in future episodes. Um, the primary one we're going to focus on is a company called Vectric out of uh, the UK. They have quite a few software programs that we sell at Stepcraft, but they're very popular amongst hobbyists and even professional CNC machines like sign shops and things. Programs like Cut2D, Cut3D, VCarve Pro. These uh, programs are very, very simple to use. There's a lot of support, a lot of videos on them. They really help. It's some of them like VCarve and, and Cut2D have basic drawing and design functionality built in as well. So you can actually eliminate the need for a design program by using one of these Vectric softwares. And we'll talk about that again in, in future uh, episodes. The other side of it is you could use commercial cam software such as Mastercam, Bobcat, EasyCam. Depending on your experience, I mean, I, I have 
customers with Stepcraft that are machinists. And so they're familiar with programs like Mastercam and they will use that as a means of converting their drawings into the G code file. There's no specific software you need. You just need to make sure that you've got the right profile set up for the CNC machine that you're going to be using. And again, that's something we'll discuss more in detail. Now, the final step is what we call machine control software. And like I said a minute ago, what that does is it takes the G code, which if you were to look at G code, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers. It's, it doesn't really mean anything unless you understand what the different codes mean within that. Think of it as it's just a completely different language. And the machine control software will take the G code. It will turn it into functions that will tell the machine how to move amongst the X, Y, and Z axis. So common software for machine control are Mach 3, WinPCNC, and uh, Stepcraft specifically uses UCCNC, which is a very powerful and easy to use program. Uh, now, most of the machine control software will show you uh, some basic functions within the actual program. It'll A lot of them will show you where the the tool's position is, a kind of a graphical representation of it in real time. So you could see what of the job has been done and what is left to be done. It's, it's kind of graphically represented. Uh, you could vary the job speed and it'll show you how fast you're moving, what your feed rate is. Uh, you could control that on most of these programs on the fly. So if you're working on something and you think that you need to run 20 millimeters a second. But once you start doing that, you can hear the spindle really straining. You have the ability to slow down uh, or speed up that, that uh, feed rate on the fly. Most programs will tell you uh, how much time has been consumed and how much time is left to complete your job, which is good because if it's a long carving job and you know that you've got an hour left, as long as everything is working properly, you know, you could walk away and do something else and know you need to check on it, you know, within a certain period of time. The machine control programs will also have jog functions that will allow you to move the tool uh, to the XYZ position that would be considered the starting location of a part. Or if you change bits, it'll, it'll allow you to manually move the head around uh, to get it back to a new starting point. The software is going to remember the uh, home positions once you start the job. So if you were to change the tool, you could re-zero it out, tell it to go to home, and it's going to know exactly where that is without you having to manually redo it again. So those are some of the basic functions that you get with uh, with a machine control software. And again, it's three basic simple steps, design, tool path, machine control. And don't worry about it. We're going we're gonna to dive into each of these in future episodes and really break everything down and make it nice and simple for you. Okay, so now that we covered some of the basics of not only the CNC machine, but the software and the steps that are required, uh, if you're new to this industry or this hobby or, or, or CNC in general, you might be asking yourself, wow, this, this all sounds complicated. You know, I bet you it's going to be very expensive to get started. And the reality is, is that there are machines out in the market that start for less than a thousand dollars and including Stepcraft, we have uh, machines that start under, under a thousand dollars. Many of them come in kit form and you can assemble them in as little as an afternoon. And because they're kit form, you're saving uh, a lot of money on the machine up front because you don't have to, the manufacturer doesn't have to pay to have somebody put it together. You're also going to save a lot of money on shipping because they come in smaller boxes and it's it's easier for companies like UPS to ship for a reasonable rate. So these machines can start it under a grand and can go all the way to tens of thousands of dollars for a commercial system. So here's something I find that I tell a lot of people. I, the good news is, is that just about anything that you want to do that you would normally think you'd need a large commercial CNC router system for, you can actually do on an inexpensive personal desktop model. Now, the only constraint and consideration is the physical work size. Uh, many commercial systems can have uh, work beds on them as big as four by eight feet. However, if you're doing a smaller job, uh, you, you can get away with machines that'll be uh, on average, you know, three by three feet, something like that. And anything that you're going to perform as far as uh, milling and carving on these larger machines can be done successfully on a, on a small machine. It's just a smaller scale. Now, Stepcraft, we offer 
five different models of machines, the 210, the 300, the 420, the 600, and our largest machine, which is the 840. And if you go look at the show notes, I put a chart up there that will show you the comparison in the different size machines, and it'll give you the work area as well in inches. So then that's one of the nice things about uh, the Stepcraft machines is that you could buy a machine that's specific to the size requirements that you need. So there's no need to buy and spend the money for a large machine if the biggest part you're ever going to work on is, uh, you know, 10 by 10 inches, then, you know, we have a machine specifically for that. So the 840, on the other hand, is the largest machine that we have. And it's perfect for if you're a woodworker or carpenter, uh, it's large enough to mill things in one piece like uh, cabinet doors. And you could do that without having to relocate materials. So uh, there's a huge range in the Stepcraft offering for machines that will meet your specific needs. Now, another question that you're probably asking yourself is that, you know, again, you need to be a, a computer wizard or a drawing wizard to be successful. And don't let that scare you. I mean, yes, all these machines do run around uh, computers. So it's, you know, that's, that's what they are. It's a CNC machine, computer numerical control. However, you don't need to necessarily know how to draw. You don't need to really be too intimidated by all of this functionality because a, we're going to walk you through everything on future episodes of the podcast and B there's a lot of helpful videos and things like that on the internet for most of the basic software. Now, the other thing that's kind of cool is there's sites online. Uh, one of them in particular is one of my favorites. It's called thingiverse.com. And I'll have a no, uh, link to that in the show notes where you could design some really cool, I'm sorry, you can download some really cool designs, which are very complicated and you can download them for free and use them on your CNC. Now, years ago when I got my first 3D printer, I was so excited to, with the technology to actually have it do something that the thought of me having to learn how to draw something in CAD to produce it uh, was a little off-putting. So when I was turned on to Thingiverse.com, I was able to go there and pick out a uh, an item, download it, and run the file off of my printer. And as a matter of fact, for the first couple of months that I had my printer, I was printing a lot of things that I specifically got from Thingiverse that were pre-made while I was teaching myself how to use a simple CAD program so I can make my own parts. So you, know, you don't need to be scared away. It's not a, a very, very complicated process. There are some things you need to know, just like with anything, but I assure you that uh, you know working together, we're going to figure it out and we're going to make sure that this is a fun process for you and we are going to help you turn your ideas into reality. Okay, so that's it for this first episode. I want to thank you very much for being a part of it. And I'm very excited to be working with you uh, in the weeks to come and break down this whole CNC world and make it manageable and, and exciting for you to be successful with it right away. Now, we covered a lot of basics today, and in the future episodes, I think we're going to take very specific things and we're going to break them down into you know complete episodes. Today was more of an overview to kind of get the, get the ball rolling, so to speak. And as we move on, we're going to include things like interviews with uh, customers that we have, uh, talking about various products, projects that they produce. We're going to really break down a lot of the software things and go into details on different tooling. And so we've got a lot planned for you in the weeks to come. And I encourage you to please uh, share the podcast with uh, friends and family. And what I would also appreciate very much, if you like what we're doing here, uh, please go to iTunes and, and give the podcast a five-star rating if that's what you feel. Uh, the more ratings that we get, the faster it's going to help us move to the top of the list so that this podcast is heard by more and more people. So we, we really appreciate that. Now, also, I'm going to put up a show notes page and the website for this podcast is called youcreatepodcast.com. And the show notes will be at youcreatepodcast.com forward slash 001. Additionally, you'll be able to leave comments on that page and I encourage you to do so. 
Uh, we'll have a contact form as well. So if you have any questions or anything specifically that you'd like us to cover in future episodes, please don't hesitate to do that. Uh, your feedback is what's going to kind of determine the direction of various episodes that we produce. So I really encourage that uh, very much. So I want to thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to taking this journey with you into the world of CNC and 3D printing and to explore your ideas because ultimately we want to know what will you create. Have a great week.